Good morning, Cornerstone. Thank you for joining us this morning as we worship together. And as a church, though we are scattered, we can be confident that by the Spirit of God, we are united as we worship Him together this morning from the convenience and safety of your homes. Before we begin worship, let me share some announcements with you first. Uh, So first, how do you stay connected in the midst of the circumstances that we're in? Uh, One good way to stay connected and also help us, the leadership, is to check your emails and read them thoroughly. Your ministry leaders are doing their due diligence in writing emails with details that you will need, uh, information that you will need, especially for children's ministry, youth group ministry, uh, Sunday school, and all that. So it would really be helpful if you read your emails as opposed to trying to contact your ministry leaders for every detail and every question that you have. Another great way to stay connected is through the connection. The connection is our uh, weekly newsletter that we send out every week on Thursdays around 4 p.m. And if you are currently not receiving the newsletter, please let me know. Send me an email at day at cornerstonepca.org. And I'll make sure to have you on this coming week's uh, newsletter. Um, The second announcement uh, that we have is this. This is a great opportunity as a church for us to exercise our spiritual uh, muscle of generosity. While we live in very uncertain times, this is a time where people in the world are watching and they're uh, funneling their finances to things that really matter. Our priorities are being rearranged, so to speak. But as a church, we can be a testimony and a witness to to the world that our priorities also lie with the advancement and expansion of God's kingdom by giving to the church. So if you would like to set up your online giving, on this video in the description, if you click there, there's a link that will take you to CCB, and there will be instructions for there on how to give. If you are still confused about this, we'd love for you to send me a message, and I will uh, be gladly help you set all this up. And now... As we begin our worship, let me draw our attention uh, from a reading from Psalm chapter 95, verse 1 through 6. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In His hands are both the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are also His. The sea is His, for He made it. And His hands form the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Church, would you bow in prayer with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We come to you as a church, your bride. We come to you as your people, knowing that there's nothing more essential for our souls and our lives than the worship of you. And even in the circumstances that we're living in currently, Father, you were not caught off guard by this. And we continually trust and know that you're still in control. Father, we pray for all the people who are at home and who have to work from home, and we have to deal with new family dynamics, and we may realize that our patience is lacking and our strength is lacking and our love may be lacking for the very ones who you've called us to love unconditionally. Father, we do ask that during those times, you may remind us, you may remind your people through the gospel, that we can do all things through Christ, that the gospel gives us the the hope to persevere, that the gospel gives us the patience and the love in the midst of anxieties, in the midst of frustrations, and in the midst of despair. Father, we pray for parents, that you will strengthen them and give them godly wisdom to see this as an opportunity to show their children, that Jesus is real and that they are being made in His image. Father, we do pray for the 
uh, elderly in our congregation who are at most risk of this disease. Father, may among their fears, may your gospel go even further. May your gospel give, give peace that surpasses all understanding. And Father, we pray for this time that you will use the church in wise ways to show the world that we're not afraid, to show the world that we're seeking your wisdom in all things, your truth, and we're seeking your glory even in the midst of all this. Father, we pray for our worship, that as we are in our homes, we may still remember that this is your day. This is the day that we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. This is the day that we celebrate your, our adoption our adoption as, as sons and daughters of your kingdom. And we may remember, Lord God, that this day is to be used for your glory alone. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, would you join me in the prayer of confession of sin? Sovereign God, we confess that although we willingly say that Jesus is King, we often fail to bow our knees before Him. Instead, we grant our allegiances to the relationships and material goods of this world. In Your mercy, Hear our prayer of confession. Grant us the humility to bow before you, the ruler of all nations, so that we may be loyal servants in your kingdom through your Son, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. Please continue in your own homes, confessing your sins before our Lord. Church, hear now the assurance of pardon. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Well, good morning, Cornerstone. Glad you're joining us as we stream this service and spend some time reflecting on God's Word. We're looking in John chapter 18 and 19 this week, and uh, the last week, this week, and a little bit of next, as we are preparing for Easter, and in particular reflecting on the death of Jesus Christ, his trial, his crucifixion, as we look forward to celebrating his resurrection. There are some themes that extend across these chapters, so we're going to be overlapping a little bit of the passage that we began last week. So follow along with me as I read from John chapter 18 verse 33 to chapter 19, verse 22. So Pilate entered his headquarters again, and he called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have, have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king? And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. 
And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourself and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement in an Aramaic Gabbatha. Now it was the day of the preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and he went out, bearing his own cross to the place called the, to the, place, called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with, and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write, the King of the Jews, but rather, this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. This is God's word. Join with me in prayer. Father, we ask that you would send your spirit into this moment and into this time, that your word would touch our hearts, that your word would change us, that we would understand your authority and your kingdom, and that we would submit ourselves to it, and that we would find rest and comfort in your authority and in your fatherly care. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Well, COVID-19 continues to spread exponentially across our country and across the globe. Last week on our stream, which you can find in the link below, last week we considered the nature of truth and how do we know what is true. And we saw that truth is understood personally, that truth is understood relationally, and that Jesus invites us to know him because Jesus is truth. He is the actual presence of God who alone is true. And both words and his works testify to this reality that Jesus is truth. Well, closely related to truth is the idea of authority. And that is what we are looking at this week, is the nature of authority and of Jesus' authority. But think about the events that are going on in our globe. Who has authority Over the coronavirus, our leaders can't contain it, scientists can't cure it, 
Doctors can't treat it. Epidemiologists can't stop the spread of it. And the president cannot control the stock market or stop a virus. Who can stop it? Who has the authority over this world and the authority over this virus? Now, some people would say, well, obviously not God, because if God has authority over this, he should stop it, or he would stop it. Yet when we come to this text of Scripture, we are confronted with how Jesus' kingdom interacts with the kingdoms of this world. We're confronted with how the kingdom of God interacts with our earthly realms and our earthly kingdoms. And the first thing that this text clarifies for us this morning is that Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. In verse 33, the text tells us that Pilate entered his headquarters again, and he called to Jesus and he said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Moments later, Jesus answers, My kingdom is not of this world. Now, Jesus' answer here is a little bit like this. Pilate says to him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus' response is, yes and no. Yes and no, not the way that you're thinking about it. For Jesus' kingdom is not an earthly political kingdom. This is really important for us to remember, especially especially in an election year. There are many times in scriptures where Jesus' followers sought to make Jesus a political king. For example, in John chapter 6, John records, Perceiving then that they were about to come and take Jesus by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. He withdrew because his kingdom is not of this world. He is not seeking to establish an earthly political kingdom. Now, the Word of God establishes three institutions. It establishes the institution of the family, also the institution of the church, and also the institution of the state or the government. Each one of these, each one of these three has its own sphere of authority. Each one has its own realm of, the, of responsibility. And their authority and their responsibility is not the same as each other, and God designed them to complement one another. And it is the obligation of each realm, whether the family, the church, or the state, to respect and to support the duties of the other institutions that God has created. And Scripture makes clear that the power of the sword is given to the state. Romans 13 makes this clear, as well as this passage. And so Jesus, in speaking to Pilate, makes clear that his kingdom is not of any of the institutions that God has given authority to in this world. Jesus' kingdom is not of the state, it is not of the family, and it is not even of the church. For the kingdom of God and Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. This pandemic that we're dealing with in our country and around our globe exposes the inability and the weakness and the limitations of the government, of the state, of human ability and human authority and human power to control things. No human has authority or control over COVID-19. This virus is a wake-up call to our world. We like to think that we are so advanced, that we are so smart, that we are so capable. We like to convince ourselves that And we are so confident that we have solved the mysteries of this world, that we have solved the problems, that we have got the scientists and the researchers and the society and the structure that can solve things and can have authority over chaos 
and over random, seemingly random events. Yet, it only takes one virus to decimate a global economy. It takes one virus to, to shut down the entire world. And this virus didn't even exist six months ago. What do we learn from this? We learned that we were created and made by God to be dependent not on the rulers of this world, but we were created and made by God to be dependent on the one who is the king and whose kingdom is not of this world. This truth Jesus emphasizes to Pilate that his kingdom is not of this world. In verse 36, Jesus says to Pilate, If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Pilate only conceives of power through politics. And what Jesus is saying to Pilate is this If I had wanted an earthly political kingdom, if I had an earthly political kingdom, my servants would be fighting and they would have fought. But the kingdom of God is not what you think, Pilate. It is not what you think. Similarly, Jesus needed to instruct this to his faithful disciple, Peter. You see, Peter, when Jesus was arrested, was ready to fight. He cuts off the ear of one of the Roman soldiers. He is ready to join with Jesus for Jesus to establish his earthly, religious, political kingdom. But when Peter does this, Jesus turns to Peter and says, Peter, put away your sword. The kingdom of God is not what you think, Peter. And to both of them and to us, what Jesus is revealing is he's saying, I'm not a political leader. I don't want people wielding the sword in my name, claiming to establish Christian rule as if I'm the one that's ruling. Jesus is saying, I'm the king of kings, but my kingdom is not of this world. There's several parables in Scripture that describe what his kingdom is like. If it's not a political entity, what is it like? Well, one parable, Jesus says that the kingdom of God is like yeast that leavens dough. It is like yeast that works in it. It works in it. It works through it. It works beyond it. It causes the dough to rise. But the kingdom of God is the yeast and not the the baked loaf of bread. Similarly, the kingdom of God works in and through and beyond the structures of this world. In another parable, Jesus says that the kingdom of God is like wheat that has been sown, and the enemy has sown weeds that grow grow up at the same time. That the kingdom of God grows in the midst of being surrounded by weeds that are growing at the same time. The implication for us is this is that the kingdom of God is not of this world. We should seek, Christians should seek, to be like yeast in society. That we should be seeking to show the Christian faith as both reasonable and desirable. And that we should seek the kingdom of God to grow in every realm, in every sphere of society. For the kingdom of God is not of this world. Instead, what Jesus makes clear, is that his kingdom is over this world. Pilate says to Jesus, are you a king? And his response is, no, I'm not of this world. I'm not from this world. Pilate says to him, well, then where are you from? This has been a question that has been a mystery throughout Jesus' life. Where are you from? Jesus doesn't answer. Then in verse 10 of chapter 19, Pilate says to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Now, Pilate has been caught between 
the truth that he knows Jesus is innocent, and the power of the mob that is outside that is yelling for the crucifixion of Jesus. He's caught between the two. And as much power as Pilate wants to think that he is exerting, Pilate is impotent before the crowd. And so when he meets with Jesus, he asserts what he believes to be his total unilateral authority over the life of Jesus and also over his death. But Jesus reminds him in verse 11, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Jesus reminds Pilate, the only authority you have is because the kingdom of God has given you authority and the authority that you have has come from one who is above you. The kingdom of God is over this world. It works in this world, but it is over this world. The kingdom of God is here already. It's not yet fully here, but it is over this world. When dealing with this pandemic and this question of who has authority over this disease and authority over this virus, the question of God and his work in the world comes to the forefront. The question of his authority, the question of his power and his power over nature and over viruses comes to the front. And we may wonder if God is the creator of the world, if he is the one who is over the world and he is the one who is the sustainer of the world. If God is the one as the Heidelberg Catechism states, if God is the one who upholds heaven and earth and all creatures and so governs them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and barren years, food and drink, health and sickness, riches and poverty, Indeed, all things come to us not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. And so when dealing with COVID-19, we may wonder, where is God's fatherly hand? What is he doing in this pandemic? How is he over this crisis? It is okay to wonder what God is doing. It is okay to not be able to reconcile in our finite minds how God could be at work or what God is up to in this. And I think we see this tension revealed in this passage. For in our text, what we see in some mysterious way that no one can fully understand we see Jesus before Pilate. And before Pilate, the sovereign king of, king of kings, the one whose kingdom is not of this world, the one whose kingdom works in this world and is over this world, here the king of kings is under the authority of Pilate whose very authority has come to him from above. It's this mystery of how the king of kings, the one of ultimate authority, submits himself to one to whom he has given that authority. How does that relate to our situation? In a mysterious way, and in a way that none of us can fully understand. God is sovereign. He holds authority over the coronavirus. And in some mysterious way that we don't fully understand, he is working over it and in it and through it. And his word reassures us in times of trial. And his word reassures us in times that we don't fully understand. As Paul writes, 
that we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. All things, even viruses that are over, out of our control. God works all things together because his kingdom is over this world. But this does beg a question. If Jesus' kingdom is not of this world, if his kingdom is over this world, why is Jesus in this world? Why is Jesus here? It is finally because Jesus' kingdom is for this world. His kingdom is for our world. Why is he subjecting himself to earthly kings and earthly authorities and earthly evil? It is because Jesus' kingdom is for our world. We see in verses 13, look at what happens here, and we see how Jesus is for our world. Verse 13 tells us this, When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement in an Aramaic Gabbatha. Now, it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him He delivered him." over to them to be crucified. And here is the world's great irony and great reversal. Pilate sits on the judgment seat and he judges the judge of the universe. And there the one who is truth is convicted by falsehoods. The text tells us that this occurred at the sixth hour of the day of preparation of Passover. John includes this detail, scholars believe, because this was the time when Passover lambs would begin to be sacrificed in Jerusalem. The Passover lamb was the lamb in the Exodus that was sacrificed so that God's judgment would pass over the people and not come upon the people. And the Passover lamb was the sacrifice that was put in place that the the Passover lamb would receive God's judgment instead of God's people. And so here, at the moment when the Passover lamb is beginning to be sacrificed, Pilate renders this judgment against Jesus. And so in this moment and in eternity, Jesus is both what Pilate puts above the cross Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, and more than that, the King of the universe. And at the same time, he is what John the Baptist declared, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is both of these things. Jesus is the King who suffers for his people. He is the king who dies in the place of his people as the Passover lamb, as John 1.29 tells us. He is the one who gives himself because his kingdom is for this world. And what Jesus' death reveals to us and why he came and why he is here and why the king of kings who is over this world would submit himself to earthly authorities, it is because of this, is that the word of God reveals that there is a greater pandemic than COVID-19. You see, not everyone is going to test positive for this virus. Not everyone is going to get it. And thankfully, not everyone, nor is everyone going to die from it. But everyone is infected by sin. And sin spreads. 
and his being in every person is not only spread sin, does sin, they are also being destroyed by sin itself. The disease of sin is endemic to the human race. And sin is eternally more destructive than any virus. So we need to fear not that which can destroy the body. But we should fear that which can destroy both body and soul. And it is for this reason that God Almighty sent His Son Jesus into this world to suffer before Pontius Pilate. The one to said that this is the reason that God sent Jesus the one before whom every knee will bow and acknowledge his supreme and total authority. It is the reason why God sent Jesus, the one who is and who will be exalted as the King of kings and Lord of lords. It is the reason why God sent Jesus, the one who is not of this world, not from this world, but is over this world. It is the reason that God sent Jesus so that we would not perish from the disease of sin, but so that we would have life and have life everlasting. If you don't know Jesus personally as the King who died to set you free from the disease of sin, I invite you today to turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, I accept you as my Savior. I accept you as the Savior, the Lamb of God, through your death on the cross, that you are there as my substitute, taking the punishment that I deserve so that I could be set free from the disease of sin. I accept you as my Savior, and I accept you as my King, that you are the one who will rule my life from now on, and I submit my life to you and to following you. For those of you who already know Jesus as your Savior and know Him as your King, we can have great comfort in the face of suffering and in the face of pestilence and in the face of disease. For Jesus said, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. He can say that because Jesus' kingdom is not of this world and it is not from this world. Jesus' kingdom is over this world and it is for this world. So may we rest in his fatherly care and may we also rest in his supreme authority. Join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. You are God Almighty. And your word calls to us in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, that if my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Father, we come before you and we ask that you would heal our land and that you would heal our globe. No human, no earthly institution, no doctor or scientist or politician can control or has authority over this virus, but you do as the one who is over this world and works in this world. Father, we freely acknowledge that we don't know how you are working, but we know that you are. So, Lord, we ask that you would preserve life. We ask, Lord, that the hope of Jesus would fill hearts and that people would know him as the one who gives life now abundantly and life eternal. And, Father, we do pray in particular for our health care workers who are on the front lines of fighting this We pray for the many who are in our congregation and for the many who are connected to our congregation that you would protect them, 
from this virus, that you would protect them from fear and discouragement, that they would find their hope and strength from you, and that they would have a peace that passes understanding as they enter into very stressful hospitals and very stressful workplaces. But above all, Father, we ask that you would bring healing, that people would turn to you, that they would seek you, and that they would find you and find rest and hope and healing in you. It is in the powerful name of Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who died in our place, and in his name we pray. Amen. Now receive the Lord's blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.